Art Chat is made possible by the support of the Artistics Harmonies Association. Create your next aha experience with us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Art Chat. I'm your host, Linda Riesenberg Fissler. And I would say about four or five weeks ago, I made a discovery that I should have made probably 20 some years ago when I started as an artist. Um, but as Artistic Harmonies grows and we start looking at uh, needs of an artist and how an artist should um, do their work and create and all of the social influences that surround that. Um, I told John, the co-founder of Artistic Harmonies, that we need some way to create an inventory to track this. So I was out on Word for the, or WordPress, I should say, for the longest time, trying to figure out if there was a plugin that could help us or if I was going to have to code this stuff. And I said, well, there, you know, I can't be alone in this. So I went out and I Googled, you know, art inventories and lo and behold, Justin Anthony <laughs> and artwork um, archive came up and I started checking them out. And I said, well, this is it. This is the answer. So Justin, welcome to our chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, just to get started, tell us a little bit about Artwork Archive and how that came about. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so Artwork Archive was actually the um, the idea that came from my my partner, who is also named John. Um, John Foistel, his, his mother is an artist from Colorado Springs. She's an oil painter. And she had lost her hard drive and lost all of her contacts, her sales, her inventory, all any exhibitions she's compete like all that information was just lost with that hard drive. So he was a computer developer um, who also happens to be an artist himself, but decided to build something for his mom. And John and I were working together at the time. I was pretty heavily involved in the, the art world. And we just decided that obviously his mom was probably not the only one that had a desire to put organization to chaos because it's not a strong suit for all of us creatives um, and also prevent anybody from ever having to deal with that again. We were the first cloud-based platform. We really wanted to create something that was a solution um, for the modern day artist, which doesn't mean someone who's incredibly tech savvy because you know we have users from you know all ages and stages, but really someone that just was looking for a way to get organized, manage their business and, and showcase their work and share who they are as an artist. So that was the main driver behind it. We've been around for over 10 years now. It's hard to believe. Serve artists in over 130 different countries. Um, so yeah, it's been a, it's been a really fun journey. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we aren't going to go too heavy into what your website and your company does, but we are going to talk about artists as entrepreneurs, because I think there is a huge problem. And I'm saying this for me, based on me and others that I have been around, um, of thinking of ourselves as a business owner, as someone that has to go out and sell our work and wear that marketing hat and wear that artist hat and wear that inventory manager hat and all of the things that come in come into play when we really start to think about our artwork as our product and not our children. So- well, And don't forget about the stigma and all the historical stigma that comes with money and art and commercialization and selling out and et cetera, et cetera. Right, yeah, we've, we've talked about some of that before. Some of my favorite names, which I've mentioned, you know, Bob Ross, you know, Thomas Kincaid, who, if you've ever seen his impressionist work, is gorgeous. Um, and then he marketed, of course, the Painter of Light series that he did. But his other work in um, impressionism is is wonderful. Um, and, and then you can even go to Jeffrey Coons and Damien Hirst and all of the other big names that we've all heard of. Hint, we've all heard of. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, that, that's that's a key part of it. So. I guess let's start with the the basic beginning and foundations. Um, why do artists need basic business skills? And and talk a little bit about the different ones that are out there um, or that they should be thinking about. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I, so I don't. So let me go back. I, I don't necessarily think all artists do need business skills. I think 
an artist that has made the decision that they want to make a living doing what they love mm -hmm. needs basic business skills. Um, I, I think if you've decided that I'm going to be a career artist, you need basic business skills. And whether you like it or not, as you said, you're an entrepreneur, you're a small business owner. And the sheer volume of hats you have to wear, whether it be accounting, marketing, you know, all these things that are there to kind of, they, they seem almost at odds with your creative process um, can be really daunting. And I think one of the biggest things we see having, you know, worked with artists so closely for so many years is um, it's immediately intimidating. It's immediately daunting. There's almost kind of an ick feeling like thinking about money and art. And then, you know, you get into conversations about how do I price this? But I, I think what we always try to advise is rather than run from this idea, we find that most of the successful artists, and when I say success, I mean both monetarily and from a career satisfaction standpoint, embrace this idea of being an entrepreneur. Um, you, you know, you talked about art as a product. You're bringing something new into this world that that hasn't been made yet. You aren't just selling a product. You're, you're selling a feeling, a, a story, an inspiration. Um, you're providing something truly of value to that buyer. Mm -hmm. And and that that merits the exchange of funds, you know, that like they're willing to pay for it. Um, so, you know, we'll I know we'll get into some of the the more granular aspects of this, but you know, money and time are are resources that allow you to more really create without stress. And I think people forget about that. Um, you know, I, and I mentioned time there as well because mm -hmm. so much of what we focus on is valuing your time and that's not just in how much time did you put into the creation of your work and really putting a value to that when you go to price that work and not forgetting that you know if, if you only think in terms of materials when you're pricing your work you're doing yourself a disservice but really how much more time can I save in order to spend more time in the studio doing what I doing what you love um, I, I love this idea of simplifying and whether forgetting about artwork archive um, you asked me kind of the categories. So I, I think initially there's, all of this is kind of unapologetically unsexy, by the way, but like <laughs> the the establishing yourself as a business, like, first of all, it's, it's the mindset. Like mm -hmm. I am looking to make a living doing what, the, like I have decided that I'm going to be a full-time artist. And that is scary as heck for a lot of people, but making that leap is that first step. And then there's the things like what what structure, what business structure works for me? Is it an LLC? Is it a sole proprietorship? And there's positives and negatives with, with all those things, but determining what business type works for you. And then really like identifying the work you wanna be doing, what's commercially viable, who's your target audience? Because if you're doing something, and I think a lot of people forget that, if you're doing something that you absolutely detest, you're, you're probably not like, it's the wrong career for you, you know? Um, and I have, um, this is just a quick aside. I do know plenty of very successful artists that in the beginning did things that they didn't necessarily love. So let me use a photographer as an example. You know, I have some really incredibly talented fine art photographers, mm -hmm. but a lot of them shot wedding for the first, you know, year or two just to make enough money yep. to, to, to fund their more creative endeavors. You know, I know a lot of artists that maybe, you know, had a negative view of prints, but some of their prints have given them access to an audience they didn't even know existed and are helping to fuel the other aspects of their career. So, you know, going back, we kind of break things up when we're thinking about artists as entrepreneurs into this establish, manage, and grow. So on the establishment side, it's determining what kind of business type, who's your audience, what am I gonna do? When it comes to managing, what like and like I said, this is not an artwork archive thing. This is a general practical thing. What system are you going to use to store your inventory? Like to keep track of your inventory, your contacts. I'm going to go back to contacts in a second. Your locations, your exhibitions, your expenses, your sales. All of these things that are kind of necessary evils in mm -hmm. the art world. Um just simply by having those under one roof where you're not looking at a spreadsheet or Dropbox or Google Drive or where do you, like having some some easy centrally located place for all of those things clears this mental bandwidth. 
if you're applying to a grant or a residency, it's all there. You want to find where your bio is or your statement is. It's all there. And I think people take for granted just how beneficial the centralization of that information is to your time, to your professionalism. And if there's an added benefit of being able to kind of present that in a more professional way, you're going to put your you know best foot forward when introducing yourself to, to galleries. Um, so that's the managed side. And then the grow side is really thinking in terms of traditional sales tactics. So what's worked forever and what doesn't work for me? What are some modern day sales tactics? You know, when Instagram came out, it was foreign to everyone and and great for artists to kind of like riff off each other and share work with each other. But then collectors started using it as a way to find new artists. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden it became a sales tool for, for people. But um, I, I really think we we find that simplification and focusing on the most basic elements really can set an artist up for success. And a lot of the other stuff is just bonus points. You know, it's it's taking you to that kind of next level. But the that putting organization to chaos is very freeing. Um, you know, having a tool where you can present like a professional is very beneficial. And yeah, uh, I, I definitely want to start talking in a second, but like <laughs> one great example of something that is probably one of the most taken for granted aspects of being an entrepreneur is contact management. And it couldn't be a more boring subject, but there is nothing more critical to the success of your career than maintaining existing relationships and fostering those existing relationships and growing new ones. So the analogy I always use is if you love a musician or an actor and they release an album or have a new movie, you're going to see them. Your existing buyers, most of the artists we see having the most success, maintain those relationships. They're growing their collector base because when they have something new, when they're working on a new project, like I want to know about that. The artist that I am into or have I purchased from before, I've already proven that I'm in love with their work. Mm-hmm. So it's only natural that I'm going to be interested in seeing. And it seems like such a simple concept when you say it, but I cannot tell you how few artists pay any attention to this contact, uh, essentially contact relationship management. Um, so that That's very true. And um, I can say that I definitely am at fault at that myself. But while you were talking, I was thinking of Artwork Archive and how I can manage that differently now that I'm starting to put my collection out on that site. For example, I could use my newsletter and say, I'm going to uh, show my latest painting just finished to you uh, along with the rest of my collection on this night through Zoom and nobody has to leave their home. You know, and yeah. then, so there's so much more, uh, you know, just coming across your website and, and of course, Artistic Harmonies is now one of your clients, but um, just doing that it really opened the door and stopped that like previously, it's, okay, I have to go find a physical space before this. And then I had to, of course, COVID came along and that made that very difficult. Um, but still, you know, now I have to go rent space. Well, gee, renting that space has gone up because people lost some income over the last few years. Totally. And and then, you know, now I have to send out invitations and I have to, you know, all of this is done kind of new world, if you want to call it that, where you can do everything online and you're still not losing any, um, if you want to call public domain issues with your, your site, if you want to talk right. about that. Uh, but, you know, you have control over that image where if you post it to social media, you could lose control over that image very, very quickly. So why don't you uh, talk a little bit about that? I know this is, but it, it to me, it is still part of being an entrepreneur because you have to control your copyrights and your, your showing to public domain. And Well, uh, well, even, so you're talking about, um, you, you touched on this kind of COVID accelerated what may have taken, you know, 15 years to, yeah. to manifest in the span of a year, everything went virtual. So Correct. having an easy way to showcase your work and share who you are as an artist online is, is kind of critical to the, I shouldn't say it's critical. It is very important for most artists. Yeah. Um, 
the there's the convenience aspect so you say you know i can just create a private room give people a sneak peek but there's also the professional aspect to it so mm -hmm. Let's say we I, I've sat the the as a jury member of uh, a number of different calls and 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 various projects. And one of the things that we always look for as jurors is how are you going to make my life easy? And if I get a consolidated professional looking report, or if I can tell that you know we asked for these five things and that artist only gave us three of them, I don't care how great their work is. If they're not following directions, that's not being a professional. So, you know, part of being an entrepreneur is being cognizant of the fact that you are competing. It's just like applying for a job. Oh, There's a absolutely. stack of resumes on that person's list. How do you stand out? And a lot of the times you stand out by being consistent, presenting yourself professionally. And and this this reliability, I think people people don't um, put enough uh uh, put enough importance on that because I can tell you, and, and I have a, a gallery wall here in town, knowing that an artist is going to deliver, knowing that they're going to not miss deadlines, knowing like those are artists you want to work with more. And so having some kind of tool that will help keep you on top of important deadlines, critical deadlines, actually this woman by the name of Deb Grosser, who's with the American Impressionist Society, we we were sitting around. Um, cool. Yeah. Great. Um, <laughs> Learn to paint with her, actually. Ago. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. We were both at awesome. Kevin McPherson's uh, workshop oh. in St. Andrews by the Sea a long time ago. So, yeah, That's I know Deb awesome. pretty well. <laughs> so I met her years ago and we were sitting around at a table um, during like a plein air event. And, mm -hmm. you know, we were just talking about like, what are some of the things that are frustrating? And they're saying, you know, exhibition like deadlines and pickup dates and like did I submit this last year what was accepted and you know we built the next day a means of tracking like a, a whole reminder system like you give us the drop-off dates the pickup the all any deadlines and the system will automatically remind you so that you don't run the risk of submitting late or you don't run the risk of a duplicate submission or anything like that just little things like that that you might take for granted really help you stand out. Um, you, you talked about um, owning your own work and public domain and, and things like that. And I, I think it's it's such a tough, controversial topic because yeah. I can tell you, even if I explain all aspects of how copyright law actually works, <laughs> at the end of the day, you and you alone still have to enforce it. If yeah. I found someone that is infringing on a copyright from something I put out there, I have to go after them and get that in force. Now, the mere fact that it's copyrighted gives me a very large leg to stand on. But at the same time, I have to expend those resources. And so when you're thinking about putting things out there, there's what the reality of the law is and then what the reality of how the world works is. And bad things are you know, often going to happen that we don't have any control over them. So being really thoughtful in what you put out there, controlling your brand, you know, and and having those things like using the private room feature to those people because it doesn't get out there. It's not crawled by any search engines. It doesn't become the part of, you know, the public internet. You know, a lot of artists are very, very private with what they choose to share and they leverage that tool to build those relationships and make people like me, the collector, feel special because if I'm getting invited to a sneak peek for an upcoming show, like I feel like I'm special. I feel like I'm being, you know, given a, you know, a privilege that isn't given to others, like the, the masses that are going to be able to see it online. Right. Right. Exactly. And I, I have gone from posting my images on social media to I'm not posting them on social media just because I've done so much research for artistic harmonies and, and finding out, you know, wow, all of those images could have been taken down and I don't have the money to hire an international lawyer to figure out how to stop them from stealing the images of my paintings, um, which may not look exactly like my paintings are as well as good, if you want to say that, because I'm not the best photographer in the world. But, um, it's so, yeah, it's yeah. such a tough thing though, because the other side of that is I, as a follower of you, want like I want to taste, I want to see what's coming. I want to get like, I may be a, a, an artist I know out of Chicago the other day posted something and I wanted to be the first to message like, 
give it to me. Don't like take this offline right now. I want it. Right. Um, and so they used it as a really clever sales tactic. So I, there is this kind of push pull with, with, with that, or, or I guess catch 22 is a better way to phrase yeah. that. Um, and it's tough because how do you give just enough to entice me, but not so much that you're giving away the store. You know, we have, we are horror stories all the time from mm-hmm. artists, um, especially more prominent ones that get copied so often and have knockoffs floating out there um, or that have come up with a formula that works and then someone just imitates them and it kind of degrades their work or makes it less, you know, unique. And it's, it's really tough. That balance is so tough, like legal, legal stuff aside. Right. um, It's really tough for your own kind of career and brand. You know, one of the things that we're doing at Artistic Harmonies is is looking at the value of the work um, of the painting itself or the photograph or any fine art piece of, of artwork and um, looking at that and saying, okay, everything has a value and that value can be degraded by certain aspects. So we're looking at that whole equation and trying to figure out, um, you know, how we address that using some um, computer methods. Let's just put it that way right now, because it's kind of proprietary. So um, that's a conversation that probably John and I and and you should have, and John, the other John, your John, um, should have offline as we start to get closer with that, because it is kind of interesting, the the work that John maybe maybe the most that may be the most popular it's certainly top three most popular question we get is how do I price work or how do I determine the value of it and I can give you once again tons of textbook answers out there that don't necessarily apply to the reality because you can have an influencer or someone say this is amazing I love it you need to check out this artist and all of a sudden the person that was charging $250 for their work is selling them for 1500 or 2000 Like it's, it's really amazing. The external factors, mm-hmm. you know, I, I always try to start from, gosh, I'm, I'm about to say something and I'm going to, I'm, I'm a liar when I say this. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I was going to say something that I myself try to practice, but that's totally, I'm, I'm full of it. When I say this, I'd like to believe that when I'm creating something, I'm factoring in the time, the resources kind of, I can't help but look at market for similar like types Mm -hmm. of things and sizing. But like at the end of the day, the reality of it is if it's someone that I know, like let's say it's a hotel client or something that I, I know is going to get exposure and have a bunch of eyes on it. I look at it through a different lens. Mm -hmm. Um, And my biggest pet peeve um, as someone who's a buyer of art, I've never said to an artist, you know, do this, it's going to be good for exposure. Or do I work with tons of street artists and mural artists and things like that. Never in my life have I said, you know, you really want to, this is prime real estate. Like you just do this for free because a lot of people are going to see this. That's It's probably one of my big, biggest pet peeves in the art world. And, and I think it really devalues the, the work that artist is doing. Um, at the same time, if I'm creating something, I like the idea of it having eyes on it. So I may give a totally different price. What's so pricing is just, it's one of the most difficult, difficult things. Yeah. In, in my world, in the software as a service world, it's totally easy, right? You, mm-hmm. you see what competitors are doing. You can play with pricing kind of to and from an experiment. And then you kind of find what the right balance is um, right. Or, or make a conscious decision to price things at such a way that you're making it more accessible on purpose because that's the ethos of your company. When it comes to the pricing of your work, it's just all. I I stared at five different works from five different artists, all almost identical in style and things like that. And there was a 20,000 range, $20,000 range in the price of the work I was looking at. And they all were selling their work, but one person had things priced for 150, very, very similar same materials, same canvas size, same all, and the other person was easily selling things for 15 to 20 K. And it's just such a strange, strange world. Yeah, it is. It's, it, it's, um, and then, and then you have the whole conversation about what happens to your art after you pass away. And all of a sudden it goes up, you know, so much more money, <laughs> 20, 50% because you're no longer alive. So 
Yeah. So your 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 air is benefit from that. On, on that topic, by the way, like mm -hmm. I left that out because we when we think about artists as entrepreneurs, we so artwork archive at our core does think in terms of that kind of establish, manage, grow. Right. But we do have a fourth thing that we really rarely talk about in an entrepreneurial capacity, and that's legacy. Hmm. So many of the artists that come to us, at least a third of the artists that use us are using us because they don't want their work to fade away long after they're gone. They, like they want it to live on. Mm -hmm. So whether it be prepping for a catalog resume or passing on to their heirs so that they can manage their estate or anything like that, this, I mean, it's called artwork archive. So this mm -hmm. idea of creating a living legacy or a living archive of your work was one of the bigger business drivers. You know, it's less on the entrepreneurial front. It's more late stage. Um, but I would argue that if you're doing a good job thinking in terms of establishing a legacy, you're doing a good job at setting yourself up for business success because you're capturing who you sold to when, the provenance of your work. You're establishing that. You're being more thoughtful about like, what is the story behind this? And then it becomes less product output focus and more, you know, these things are living, breathing, you know, things with life that, that are going to endure long, you know, after you're gone. Yeah, you um my my nephew probably thanks you because he is the person after I pass, hopefully many years from now, he's gonna be the one that's gonna take over my legacy. And I I told him, I said, you know, I said, not only is there my artwork, but there are all the art chats that are out there, because I've been doing this for 12 years. So there are all those art chats. There are, you know, all these different paintings or some that I've destroyed, some that are, you know, in um collectors' hands and so yeah, your, your artwork archive is actually pushing me to, and I, I have them all saved on discs, you know, <laughs> and thrown around in different places. So now I'll be able to put all of that in one place, which is uh, going to be very, very helpful for him because before it was always, I'll let Patrick deal with that. Well, now Patrick won't have to deal with that because I'm getting my act together and, sure. and doing that for him. So so I've got a couple statements that uh, we talked about in the green room before we went on on the air. Sure. Um, I'm just going to read them and I'd like to get your um, assessment of them and whether you agree with them or not or sure. other opinion, whatever. So the first one um, has to do uh, with the approach to selling art as an entrepreneur. So it's a, an artist should be willing to approach selling art like any other entrepreneurial business. Agree or disagree? <laughs> hard one in it Gosh, it is hard because it... so my knee jerk my knee jerk for some like pre-programmed reason is to say no the reality is I think it's yes because when I think about like how do you stand out as like if I'm going to buy a bottle of wine off the shelf you know it's oftentimes it's a label or the like the story like I know it's a uh, a women-owned vineyard and or they're doing something interesting like I maybe I'm I might I might be a bad person to ask because honestly I'm so obsessed with the 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 creative marketing the story half the time I'm buying art mm -hmm. it's not that I don't love the work of art I'm buying but I love the artist much more or I love the story behind the work like that's what's intriguing me so I I think you do have to be creative. Like if you just put a plain white, like if you put the same painting that everyone's doing, like the plain air community, a lot of people are out there in the field doing the exact same landscape. How are you making it different? How are you making your piece stand out? And a lot of the times it's your story. So similarly, you ask, you know, the, the original question, um, I, I kind of look at you are the company. So like if I think of brands, I wear some Patagonia stuff because I really love the, the ethos of that particular brand and I choose to patronize them. Um, on the artist side, if you like the artist's story or what they're about and, and them as a person, um, but the last work I bought, I was obsessed with the way this woman made ink. Like she makes her own pigments and all the stuff and she's like a mad scientist <laughs> and I wanted to own it because of the story behind the brand. Right. Um, I happen to love the work too. But like, yeah, I, I, I do think you have to kind of look at it that way that it is a product and, and kind of 
not just marketed in isolation. I just, I went off on such a tangent on this one. I don't, I, I was so taken <laughs> aback by the question. And, <laughs> that, that's, uh, yeah. Sorry yeah. if that was a terrible answer. No, no, it wasn't. Actually, you, you said something that I like, uh, but it's one of these things where I can, as an artist and as someone who's studied with a lot of different present masters um, and have gone to different workshops and things like that, um, I can probably, you could probably take the person's name off of the work, set them set them in a row, and I can tell you who their mentor is. Okay, so there is, I mean, to me, that that's almost too much of a product. It's almost like I'm trying to sell someone else's work, for example, instead of yeah. hearing my own voice and letting yeah. my own voice take on to that or, you know, really approach that. And it, so it's, it's interesting when I heard your answer about this. And then if I think about, you know, well, XYZ artist sells because XYZ artist paints this way, but XYZ artist never was able to tell me what the technical reason for doing something that way. Like I'm all for teaching technical reasons and that's what I are technical foundations of the work. Um, but if somebody wants to paint a building pink, even though the building isn't pink, but that's what's talking to them, I'm like, go for it, well, you know, right? Well, so here's 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 another counterpoint to it, though. I'm I'm standing in, so there's, I'm standing, I, I got a first look at this opening that was going to happen in this um, very large gallery space, and it had probably seven or eight artists that were going to be presenting that night. And I had time to really sit and read the story, like what came behind the art. And, and the curator was sitting next to me. And she says, um, nobody who's going to be walking these halls tonight gives a SHIT. They don't care. That piece is going to speak to them on first blush or it's not. Mm -hmm. And those artists put out not what they think is a commercially viable thing, but what was important to them and what they thought meant something to them. And so I was kind of torn. I was like, I, I was taken aback. It's totally true what she's saying. Mm -hmm. um, but not all working artists have the luxury. I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. I, so some of my friends, I use that photography example with some of my friends shooting wedding. I have some friends that do repeats of things they know sell very well, even though it's not their favorite things to do. And in that case, I do think they're looking at it as a product. Mm -hmm. Whereas they're using the money they get to push themselves, to evolve into different mediums, to, to put out stuff that really lays their soul bare on a canvas and don't care at all about the commercial viability. I mean, that's what I think the, the, there's so much wonder in being an artist, in creating things, but it's easy to say if you've got the financial means or the time to be able to do that. So once again, we're at this balance where it's really tough to establish that balance. If everyone could put out something that immediately is loved by everyone else and is a commercially viable product and it happens to be what they love, that's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, but I don't think everyone has that luxury. No, I, I agree with that totally. And we kind of, the next statement I'm going to read, um, that kind of goes in with what, where we kind of ended up <laughs> in that discussion. Yeah. So, um, and, and you may not know the how, but does an artist um, balance or manage to support their creativity or autonomy and advance their capacity for adaptability and create artistic as well as economic and social values? So the last statement that you just said, kind of gets into that it's like how are we supposed to balance all of this create something that sells yet have this voice creative artist voice out there um that also provides a, a some kind of social value i mean after you after you get your image if you want to call it that as an artist and i produced one piece of work that is totally outside of what i used to work and, and artists are evolving so that's almost a given that we're not going to what I created 10 years ago doesn't look anything like what I create today um, even if it's still a landscape you know because I'm continually to uh, I, I got so it. as an entrepreneur how do we manage that to say that you know yeah I'm still the same artist with that same thing that you like about me and yet here's this new painting that maybe you don't like as much 
or maybe is so totally different, you don't like me as an artist anymore. <laughs> so you said something really important there. As an artist, I'm always going to evolve. When I said um, earlier on, when we were talking about that established aspect, one of the big things in established that phase is establishing who your target audience is. Because just like you have different genres in music, that you know there's different audiences that like those varieties of music similarly i think what you're going to find is and this is one of the big entrepreneurial challenges is as you shift or as your style changes that same audience that you may have relied on for so many years as as being like big consumers of work may not love your next album <laughs> you know <laughs> so but there is an audience out there. So, so retargeting, finding a way to be adaptable and to pivot and to get in front of those and, and test which markets, like maybe they're no longer on Instagram. Maybe they're on a new media, stuff like that. And I think I always worry about artists getting this kind of analysis paralysis because there really are so many different sites and social things to keep up. I am a big fan of like, doing micro experiments, waiting to see one perform, and then really sticking to that. Because if you've got to maintain a newsletter, a blog, an Instagram feed, a Facebook post, a Twitter feed, TikTok, all these things, I don't think you're ending up spending time in the studio doing what you love. I, I think you get run ragged. Similarly, you know, all these artists, and I'm going to bring it back to your question, I promise, but like, the one of the biggest kind of internal conflicts we see is all of these artists just racking their brain on what online shopping cart or e-commerce thing is right when the reality is the the artists were selling work long before any of these things existed these things are tools they can help but like there is no one right answer for that you know i think one can argue if you're selling mass market lower volume prints where you don't want any friction at the checkout, something like a Shopify or like a dedicated shopping platform. But like at the end of the day, you just need to be able to give someone an invoice. And people were doing that on post-its before, you know, I've had an artist give me an invoice on a post-it before and I still paid them. But like in a modern day <clears throat> with Venmo and Square and all these millions of different ways to pay, like you just want to figure out how you can get someone to express an intent that they're interested in buying and be able to shoot them away to pay you. And there is no perfect solution. If a collector wants it, they're not going to walk away from the deal if it's, you know, not the exact payment format that they were looking for. Okay. Um, that was a slight tangent, but um, well, it's okay. no, the, the adaptability I think is really key. Um, I, I think what the pandemic showed us is just how critical the role of art is in not just the the creative process and the inspiration process, but in the healing and the happiness side of things. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, we, we do a ton of stuff at Artwork Archive with arts and healing. Um, one of the people on our team has a handicapped child um, and her father just happens to be one of the most prominent writers in arts and healing. And she spends so much time working with hospitals on the curation of their art programs and all this stuff. And when you see the benefit of that in a hospital setting or even in a corporate setting, mm -hmm. like walking around and seeing like these storied walls and, and these beautiful walls or walking into a hotel and seeing those pieces, it really kind of set the tone. So, you know, I, I think you can have both things. It, like when you're, when you're selling particularly to a commercial client, you have to bear in mind the social impact or the feeling you want that to elicit. So I do think you're not selling your soul necessarily to do the, that person wants a yellow painting above their fireplace, you know, the, because <laughs> there's going to the always be those, by, right. <laughs> something like that. And, and as grossed out as I am, the la I was in a, I was traveling recently and I was in a gallery and, and someone did like total cliche walked in. She's like, the couch is yellow, that piece is yellow. And I'm thinking that is a $22,000 work of art. <laughs> Didn't even blink an eye, just yeah. wrap it up. And I was like, but don't you want to know about this art? Like, if you understood the story behind, like, this is like, anyway, they didn't care. They just want, so that exists. But at the end of the day, I do think there is just such a critical role that art plays of whether you're exchanging money 
for the sale of it. And I think if you're maintaining your integrity as an artist and, and staying true to the, the why of what you created, and in your case, let's say it is you're doing landscapes, but the technique is involving. I mean, that's part of your journey, your story, you know, the like the things you're able to tease out, like capturing shadows or light in a different manner than you have before. Like that's going to translate from the canvas to right. the, the audience. Yeah, on the, the folks that are watching on YouTube, you can see three, these paintings behind me are three of my works. And one of them is my little girl. She's a cat. So that's one way I paint. Then there's the landscapes and then there's the push to get to abstraction. <laughs> so you could tell I'm kind cool. of having fun in here, but um, yeah, so it's, 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 it is interesting. Um, like, as I tell everybody, I may be sitting here with a very business face on and doing an art chat at this point, but in the back of my mind, I'm painting two different paintings right now. <laughs> and, and one of them is, is a, a very big push from something, uh, you know, something that is very, if you want to say impressionism, more realist type of thing to just taking that out to something that's uh, much more abstract. And then the other one is a, the painting that I'm currently working on that's on my easel and uh, things that I don't like with, about it and things I want to change. So not only while you're creating your business plan or your marketing strategy or things like that, you can still have that creative side of your work going on in your mind. And it does really amaze me at times when I'm very creative on that side, I end up finding the answers that I want for the very left brain things to do. And and budget, like budget your money, budget your time. I mean, this is another real entrepreneurial choice. Like I know personally that if I don't have the crazy project, like if I don't have the space and and bandwidth to get this idea that's trying to jump out of my head and free it, <laughs> even though it has no commercial viability or any, like if I don't budget for that, um, I'm unhappy right. because I'm not letting that out. So I think similarly, when you're putting together a budget and you know that about yourself or you know you're trying to experiment with something or take your practice to a different level or in a different like direction, mm -hmm. budget that time. No, like an out, make sure you're allocating time, money, and effort to that while still staying true to those things that you know are working for you to kind of keep the wheels turning right. or keep the lights on, I guess, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it is interesting um, from that standpoint of finding that balance. Um, and one thing that I, I do want to talk a little bit about, I'm going to go back to um, Artwork Archive because I think this is important and a lot of folks including myself early on, just kind of go, oh, well, we're going to ignore that. They didn't ask for it. It's okay. And that's the certificate of authenticity. Um, you have a number of different ways that you can do that. On You have a report that generates that, um, that, that, that I've been playing with. But also more interestingly uh, to me, because this is where Artistic Harmonies is, is going to start looking, is you know, having that QR code on there. So um, not only do am I going to be passing a certificate of authenticity to the collector, I'm also going to be passing that QR code to them because it's very specific to that painting. Uh, it's another way of tracking, if you will, where that ends up. So talk a little bit about how did you guys jump from um, just having, you know, I guess what I'm asking is, what's the importance of this certificate of authenticity? And sure. then... Um, what do you see QR codes being used for on artwork archive? Sure. Um, so the first, uh, I think that the the establishing, like by the very name, you're you're certifying the authenticity of the work. In a, a day where there's so many clones, the rise of AI art, like the the commoditization of art and all this stuff. Um, one thing that one of a kind artwork has is its uniqueness. Um, it's it's made by a human's hand. And when you're certifying the authenticity of that work, it makes it stand alone. It gives gravitas to the work, weight to the work. As a collector, it also makes my life easier for when I'm cataloging it, it immediately helps me establish proof of ownership, the, that this work is genuine and it serves as a document for me to kind of add to my, you know, provenance file, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think, and it's such an easy thing to do. 
I don't care if you use what software you know, but I'm saying, no, it, it is, it is, <laughs> but, but it is people take it for granted. But I, you know, I have one from a painting I bought not that long ago that the artist did by hand in a calligraphy pen with their signature that I thought was really interesting. Now that's very labor intensive, but if you're selling at volume, that would probably be very hard to maintain, but I have that. And it's, you know, it felt like, and not an equal way to the work itself, but it felt like a necessary companion to that work. So I really advise all, all artists to, to include certificates of authenticity because it does establish, like it is a more professional thing to do. Um, the QR code, we see it really used in three different ways. So one is the internal record purely for inventorying purposes. So now that QR codes are ubiquitous, meaning they are native to any Android phone and any Apple phone. You don't need an app or anything. It was so fussy back in the day. And I honestly thought they would go away for good. <laughs> COVID, once again, found a use for this and forced Apple and Google to, or Android to, to make that native to all phones. So we see people using it from a purely inventorying standpoint, meaning they will generate internal QR code that when you scan it, like let's say, your uh, the the cat painting in the back you put a little label on the back of it because you have storage racks or you're you're putting it to the side when you scan it it'll bring up that exact record in your artwork archive account that only you can see here's the expenses that went into this painting here you know here's the history here's where it's exhibited and that's only for you the second way is the external view so this is more in your marketing or sales phase where you have it up in an exhibition or something like that someone scans it and they want to look at it later they can just you know scan that and then look at it on their phone at a later time or you have it on a business card or whatever the third is what we call wild card urls so let's say that you in particular were going to have a larger exhibition and you wanted to do an announcement for that exhibition or you wanted to um have you know a flyer or on all of your wall tags you didn't want to have it just for that particular work of art you wanted it to take them to that exhibition url on your own website so that's called a wild card url or a custom url when you scan that qr code it would take that to your main exhibition page on your website that's probably one of the most common and most popular right now because a lot of people are trying to drive people to see the breadth of their work at an exhibition or a show or a new project they're working on rather than just fixating on the one because that one may be sold. Mm -hmm. So at least that way, it gives you more of the control to drive them to your website, which for a lot of people is their main brand. Cool. Oh so, yeah, that's, it's amazing as much as we maybe don't want the computer age to come in and affect the uh the art and artwork and artists themselves um I, you know it, it's like no denying it <laughs> it's it's here it's it's gonna stay so <laughs> kind of crazy it is and that's a you know that's a story for another podcast but we we've really you know we've been putting out um content for over 10 years on our on our blog and it's always been a free resource and free webinars and, uh, you know, back to that topic of CRM really, or the contact relation management. Um, we should in the notes put a link to those webinars, like the business related webinars, because they're mm -hmm. free and they're, I mean, we did one on taxes and one on, you know, we, we choose subjects that tons of art, how to put your best foot forward when applying for residencies or grants. Mm -hmm. And all those webinars are free and, and they're awesome. But on the topic of AI art, we're we're really internally debating how we're going to cover this because I don't think anybody understands the implications of of what this is going to do. You talked about putting your art out there online. If you're putting it online, it's been crawled. So like when these programs, like in Dali, one of the the mainstream programs, when I'm typing painting of a cat in the style of Monet. Um, because it knows everything Monet's ever done, it's able to replicate that cat in, I mean, it's, it's scary. To me, I, I tend to be like anything. I think it could be used as a tool 
um, like when I'm experimenting with color palettes or want to like, like it's easy for me to, to mock up something with, with the help of a computer. Like I use Photoshop or something to like give myself ideas or something. So I look at it. I, I think there could be some positive stuff to it. Um, but going back to this authentic authenticity thing, you can't, all those things are computer generated, which doesn't make them lesser necessarily, but to me as a collector of art, I assign less value to something I know wasn't created by the artist hand. Yeah. And that's that to me personally, and I'm not alone in that. But Most yeah. of the yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I was say there's there's one story that um I had forgot when we were talking about authenticity, and but you just just reminded me. Um we were at an art auction, and uh, this was a just a local art auction in, in a city trying a fundraiser for the actual art center and um somebody had bought what they called was a um a rembrandt plate if you will it, it's just a real mm -hmm. thin little i mean just pencil drawing kind of thing and whoever this person bought it from said it was a rembrandt and i had people um bidding at my table and uh, on this particular thing and and nowhere was there a certificate of authenticity now i'm not saying that rembrandt should have had one but at some point because certificate of authenticity didn't cross their minds back then um and if it did it was hey i have my signature is right there on the on the plate or it's right there on the painting or whatever uh, but it's really kind of interesting because you know through the years something as important as a rembrandt figuring or, or painting or artwork, at some point, someone would have created a certificate of authenticity, you would think. But right. this particular um, painting was, I mean, this, this particular item was getting up into the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And this is a very small town. And I'm sitting here thinking, yeah, I don't know, you know, so the person at my table ended up winning the bid. And the person brought it over and I said, well, where's the certificate of authenticity? And they looked at me like I had five heads. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So I had to give the person that bought it because I brought it up some advice. And that was, you need to go get that appraised. You need to go um, figure out if that's really what you bought. And the people right. who know will know whether or not it is. And I said, and if it is, you need to create, a, have them create a certificate of authenticity so that when you go to sell this, or your children go to sell this, they right. have something that said it really is a Rembrandt. And I said, if you need somebody to look at that and say, yes, it really is a Rembrandt, I know someone who can do that. And they're just- I, yeah, mean, I mean, there's entire industries that exist to do nothing else, but basically art detective work. Right. You know? But I mean, just to demand that much money on just word of mouth was amazing to me. I mean, it, and unfortunately, I think they were kind of sorry they- paid that kind of money after I told them what they need to do <laughs> to make sure that it was a, a Rembrandt. But, you know, I, and in another way, I kind of also felt like they were being taken. And, you know, it's like that was the best I could do politely mm -hmm. to say that um, without like causing a lot of problems. But um, so, again, it's very important for artists to have a certificate of authenticity with your work so that the years from now, there is no question. Uh, whether or not it is your work. And, and if I take that back to um, people who are being mentored by uh, men, you know, by masters today, and maybe there's that influence that's in there. I mean, there's a lot of uh, work that is out there. I know one particular piece in Cincinnati that was attributed to, um, trying to think, of, it may have been Rembrandt again. That's probably why it's sticking in my mind because I do know somebody who, can look at a painting and say, yes, that's Rembrandt or no, that's not Rembrandt. Or, mm. you know, that's 50% Rembrandt and one of his students <laughs> or something. But, you know, it's in a, a museum and the person was saying, well, this has been attributed to Rembrandt and then it's been not attributed to Rembrandt. So it's going back and forth. So again, if you have that authenticity statement, uh, that certificate there with your work, it takes all that guesswork away. Um, and, and hopefully the person that's collecting reveres that as much as they revere the painting itself. So, sure. Sure. Okay, so do, anything you wanted to add, Justin, before I- No, 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 that's, okay. that's great. Okay, so the last piece is kind of interesting. We're gonna get back into this entrepreneurial versus um, artist thing. Uh, so there's like two 
portions of this. See, you say versus. As yeah, if I didn't say versus. If they can't, I? if they can't, if they can't coexist. Bad, bad you can, you can <laughs> listen. You can be, you can be both. You Thank you. <laughs> well, and this one kind of sets it up as two different things. So we can get into okay. that whole discussion too. So uh -huh. if your passion is building processes, growing teams, selling businesses, you're an entrepreneur. If your passion is a subject of your work, you exist to create particular kind of product or service, you're an artist. So my question to you is going to be, isn't it the same thing? Can't we just say that they're an artist entrepreneur and they're doing all of that? Some of the most, so I've worked in the startup world for a long time and then the, the corporate world before that. Um, some of the most amazing, brilliant entrepreneurs I know are artists. I think artists, you know, everyone talks about left brain, right brain, and, you know, the, not the shortcomings, but but some of the common pitfalls that many artists fall prey to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and And I think we can all agree organization on the whole may not be everyone like every artist strong suit or anything like that but creativity the ability to look at a problem in a different way or through different lenses um adaptability like all of these things that that i think make someone a great creative also i think set them up to be a great entrepreneur mm -hmm. which is why i think the idea seems so much more daunting than it is when the reality is, if you're just doing some very basic things, not things that are unapproachable or have any kind of high intellect quote, you know, quote that you need to meet or anything like that, just basic organizational things, basic present like a pro related things. Um, I think artists are really like, they're set up to be amazing entrepreneurs. Like if people are like, well, I can't remember anything. Well, I'm flighty. And I like, I just go from one, like, those are things everyone has. Like most people are 80 percenters. They, they get a project to 80% and then they don't finish the 20%. Everyone struggles with that. Most people struggle, whether you're an artist or not with, with these common pitfalls that, that, that are, that all humans are prone to. Um, but man, I, I, I can't tell you how often I hear this artist versus business or artist versus entrepreneur and it's tough i i do think there is that stigma and embracing it is more freeing than it is limiting mm -hmm. um and it's more beneficial than it is detrimental to one street cred or authenticity or genuine nature or any of those things right um i do i really find artists and i, and I hear this almost every day artists that like creatives work better in a box like the 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 more distinct the lines like my worst nightmare is to give like have someone be like there are no restrictions to this you know project paint you know paint whatever you want create whatever you want. no like get like <laughs> put a box around this because then a fight like how can i maximize the space and similarly from a, a business standpoint by having discipline and regimen and just putting even the most basic semblance of a business, not so much a business plan, but like a structure together, mm -hmm. frees up your bandwidth to, to breathe, to be creative. And and because think of how stressful it is when you're going to submit to something and you do, or you have to email your, your gallery something. Where the heck are these images? How do I fit in this email? Where's my statement? Where's my bio? Where And you're all of a sudden... You're like that's stressful. Whereas if it's just all right there, you know, it makes life easier. Yeah. It, it's kind of like um the hurting butterflies of artists, you know, that it you know, it, it, it's very painful whether you're the artist itself or the person that's trying to deal with that flighty butterfly artist, they don't have time. It, the one thing that that is very, very clear out of the last three years is, you know, we don't have the most patience <laughs> anymore in the world. If we want something, we want it now. And, and the fact, I mean, thank, the service yeah. industry has taken a big hit because of our demands on wanting everything at this particular place. So don't think for right. a second that the gallery owner or your collector or anyone's have all this time in the world for you to be over there trying to find the one piece of work that they wanted to buy from you. Yeah. 
So, you know, we, it's time for artists to get rid of that. You know, I'm an artist. I have to be this way. I have to be this flighty person. No, you're a, you're a business artist, which means that you want to sell professionally and you need to be organized. And like you said, just taking it, you know, small steps at a time, putting yourself in a particular box. I remember someone saying to me a long time ago, it's like, where do you see yourself as an artist 20 years from now? And it's like, okay, this is a cliff. I'm falling off now because yeah. <laughs> I can't think where I am 20 years from now. You know, if somebody yeah. would have said to me, I would be still doing art chat 12 years after I started, I would say, no, I, no, I can't find all different types of, you know, conversations to have about art and, you know, that would fill 12 years. And I started looking at that totally differently as this is a historic record. So what is it about the time that I'm living as an artist? Do I want to capture? And that mm. brings a whole different um, relationship to how I'm doing the podcast, for example. Sure. So, sure, you sure, know, sure. at PNG, it was always one year, three year, five year, 10 year plans that we always had to Procter and Gamble that we always had to pull together. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, every engineer there who went to school, every PhD who went to school had struggled past three years because they had no idea what was influencing that market. So we're no different. As much as that statement that I made wants to set us up as a, you're an entrepreneur, you're an artist. No, the, you know, that, that to me is just a wall that they put up themselves and sure. we need to like knock that down because we can be both. Yeah. And I, and I do think it is so daunting to some people, even, even the idea of inventorying your work if you're an artist of you, you you said in the beginning i wish i had found this earlier um i think the reality is take taking your time like get the work that's more current that's more top of mind in so you can start benefiting from it being cataloged and then save the older stuff for a rainy day you don't have to do everything at once even the mere like step of recording who you sold work to when you're selling it, like getting into that habit, you can't remember what happened two years ago. I'm not saying you, one can't yeah. remember what, like did COVID happen two years ago or three years ago? Like I, don't, I have no track of time. <laughs> and where I, am. <laughs> I sure as heck can't remember. Like you, you think when you're doing it that you're never going to forget it. And then, you know, it's out of your mind. So really kind of being good at keeping those records. It's such basic stuff and it's so yeah. easy. Like it takes minutes. Yeah, so. Absolutely. So right. I'm gonna, um, as we kind of wrap up here, I wanna thank you naturally for your time, Justin. I know you're you're very busy. No, and, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, and um, if you think of anything in the future that you wanna come on and chat about, we can certainly uh, have that happen as well. But I do want to tell our listeners, do head over to Artwork Archive because their blogs, Katie Carey, I believe is the person that heads up that area. She's the, the head of content. Yeah, yeah. And I actually want to approach Katie and see if I can get Katie on to talk about how you create wonderful blogs because Artwork Archive's blog is so informative. Very, very, it's not, it is worth your time to sit there and read as much as you can. Set aside 15 minutes to read a blog a day because their blog is wonderful. It has a lot of information. Um, I'm going to be working with Katie over uh, the next couple of months so that I can highlight some of uh, the information that is on our work archive um, and have them visit your blog. Um, so that's going to be happening. But yeah, it's a wonderful blog. There's a lot of information out there. Like uh, you mentioned, you have couple videos and things the like webinar, that. Yeah. yeah the webinars yeah the webinars webinars are also are, are also free resources i mean we've 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 done that from the beginning it's it's i, I really appreciate you saying what you're saying because it's it's one of our biggest points of of pride we really strive to put out genuinely beneficial content that that doesn't require a subscription like there's no paywall or anything it's just free resources to kind of help the, the art community. And right. whether you're an artist, a collector, an organization, uh, an art professional, a consultancy, for, like there, there's something for, for everyone. But those webinars, especially on the topic of entrepreneurialism, there are some that I think are bite-sized enough that I highly recommend just like speed through. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I think you'll get a few nuggets out of there that will be beneficial. Right. Yeah. So, so please go out and do that again. Um, artwork archive. 
com. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. And I'll I'll put that out. It'll also be in the show notes so that you'll you'll see that there as well. And again, thank you, Justin, for your time. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, everyone. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Art Chat is made possible by the support of the Artistics Harmonies Association. Create your next aha experience with us.